Over the years, G20 summits have come and gone with the aim of allowing the leaders of the world's main economies to talk about trade and economic matters. But these leaders are politicians, and politics are always more important and much more engrossing to them than economics. Over the next couple of days, it'll be Syria that dominates everything in St. Petersburg. The host is Vladimir Putin, and like all hosts at these dues, he's got a big team of ministers with him to ensure things go well. The Russians stand to gain in kudos and status from organising a smooth and effective summit. But they're also, of course, protagonists in the argument about Syria. Still, as the G20 host, Putin can't afford an unseemly bust-up with the West over the question of bombing his protégé Syria, so he's permitted himself a little bit of wriggle room. He was asked whether he would support the bombing if he became convinced the Syrian government had been behind the chemical attack. I do not exclude this, but I would like to draw your attention to one absolutely key aspect. In line with international law, only the UN Security Council could sanction the use of force against a sovereign state. It all comes down, inevitably, to who you believe. Today, Putin's own experts said they'd investigated a chemical attack in Syria in March and discovered that the weapons were similar to those used by the rebels. In this business, facts are what you want them to be. So, will there be an attack? President Obama said today it wasn't his credibility at stake, it was the world's. First of all, I didn't set a red line. The world set a red line. The world set a red line when governments representing 98% of the world's population said uh, the use of chemical weapons are abhorrent. In Washington tonight, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has voted to give Obama the bombing window he wants. It looks as though both the Senate as a whole and the slightly less sympathetic House of Representatives could vote on the whole thing on Monday. In Syria itself, the regime is now doing better, though the rebels are still putting up a fight. These pictures, which haven't been finally verified, are said to show fighters on the eastern edge of Damascus itself, using a network of secret tunnels. But who are the rebels? Once we thought of them as would-be Democrats, supporters of the Syrian Spring. Then Al-Qaeda muscled in on the fight. The opposition in Syria is really diverse. It varies a lot from area to area. And that balance is actually changing all the time, both because of fighting and because there is a gradual process of radicalization. The more brutality people are facing, the more people are thinking that violent resistance and sometimes an ideological approach are the only ways forward. But it's certainly not as simple as this being simply Al-Qaeda versus Assad. So who is Syria's Saddam Hussein, the dictator we love to hate? Actually, when I met Bashar al-Assad a few years ago, the former London ophthalmologist turned president didn't seem to me to be dictator material at all. So much so that I infuriated his officials by asking him if he really was in charge here. His reply was characteristically mild. I'm in charge, of course, legally. But some in the West, they used to say that he's, he's not in control. Somebody else is controlling him. At the same time, they say he's a dictator. And they answer many times, if I'm, if I'm a dictator, I should be very strong. And if I'm not in charge, uh, I should be uh, very weak to, uh, to be a dictator. So they have to set up their mind uh, about this. Well, things have moved on an awful lot since then, of course, but I still don't feel that Assad has the drive, perhaps the sheer nastiness of character, to be running the campaign against the opposition. I think he's a figurehead, and that a lot of nastier people, including his younger brother, are really calling the shots. The final preparations for tomorrow's G20. Vladimir Putin surely can't save the Assad regime in the long run. It's hard to think the regime can continue indefinitely. The eye doctor from London will surely end up at The Hague, if he manages to avoid a nasty Gaddafi-like end, that is.